Welcome to River's Edge Community Church and to this special Easter Sunday service. While we still cannot and should not be together physically, we can gather in the bond of love as we worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and give thanks for our redemption that is found in Christ Jesus. Today is Resurrection Sunday. We're glad you're here. This we believe, that in a world filled with despair, there is hope. That in a world filled with sin and death, there is life. For we believe that God, the Creator and King, created us to be in relationship with Him. But we rejected our God, and we betrayed our King. And as a result, our world fell into sin. But God sent His Son into our world to redeem us and to put things in our world back to rights. And we believe that Jesus died for us, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. And we believe that on the third day, Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Life conquers death. Love conquers hopelessness. Grace conquers sin. And joy conquers all fear. And we believe that now Jesus waits until the fullness of time to reclaim his world and to restore it to creation's beauty. This we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Son of the living God, our Savior, King of kings, and Lord of lords. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Say it with me. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God our Father, Creator of all, today is the day of Easter joy. Our Savior is risen. This is the morning on which the Lord appeared to the disciples who had begun to lose hope. They had seen all of their dreams crumble around them. 
And Lord, this year we sort of are seeing a similar thing, that all of our hopes for the near future uh, just dashed. Many plans canceled, and even today we cannot meet together as we would love to do as a community. You open their eyes to what the scriptures foretold, that first Christ must die, and then he would rise and ascend into his Father's glorious presence. May the risen Lord breathe on our minds and open our eyes that we may know him in the breaking of bread and follow him in his risen life. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Scattered throughout the Old Testament are God's promises of the coming of the Messiah King. The light of the world was coming. Isaiah writes, about the coming of the Messiah. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. But when this Messiah came to us, we put a crown of thorns on his head, and we took hammer and nails, and we crucified him. We killed the author of life and disowned our Messiah. On Friday, at the time of the afternoon sacrifice, Jesus became our Passover lamb, and he breathed our last. That was Friday. Then there was the silence of Saturday. And then there was the hopelessness of Saturday night leading into Sunday. And then God said, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord rises upon you. And up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph over his foes, he arose, he arose, Christ Jesus arose. Let's sing it together. Up from the grave he arose.
Today's prayer of the people is from St. Gregory the Great, who lived in the 6th century. And we pray this prayer because we want to be reminded that we are rooted in the history of God's people. And we are rooted in the bond of love with all God's people of all time, even though we are members of different traditions. And we are rooted in the hope and joy of the resurrection. And we are rooted in the thanksgiving of all God's people for God's glorious redemption of His people. Let us pray together this prayer of thanksgiving and praise. Pray with me, please. It is only right with all the powers of our heart and mind to praise you, Father, and your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Father, by your wondrous condescension of loving kindness towards us, you gave up your Son. Dear Jesus, you paid the debt of Adam for us to the Eternal Father by your blood poured forth in loving kindness. You cleared away the darkness of sin by your magnificent and radiant resurrection. You broke the bonds of death and rose from the grave as a conqueror. You reconciled heaven and earth. Our life had no hope of eternal happiness before you redeemed us. Your resurrection has washed away our sin, restored our innocence, and brought us joy. How inestimable is the tenderness of your love. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We invite you now to pray where you are and lift up your concerns to the Father. And let us pray for those who are sick. And let us pray for our first responders and our medical workers. And let us pray for those who are anxious and overwhelmed. And let us pray for those who are close to our hearts. And let us pray for the things that are heavy on our hearts today. Pray with me in silence. Father God, on this Easter Sunday, we are reminded that there is nothing that is impossible with you. Christ conquered death. He arose from the tomb. And therefore, when we pray to you, we know that you hear us and that you move in response to our prayers and that you have us and that you love us with a never-ending love. We trust you with our hearts, our souls, and our lives. Come, Father, now into our hearts. Give us the joy of the resurrection. Give us the faith of the resurrection. And move in us so that we would always be your people. Hear our prayers. And come now, Lord Jesus, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 to 9, and verses 17 to 22. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. 
So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Our refrigerator exploded. Now, I am going to assume you don't know the meaning of the word explode in that context. Because if you did, even though I am recording this at my house on Saturday, and you are listening to it on Sunday at your house, I still would have expected to hear your gasp of empathy after I said that. So let me explain. Two weeks ago, our refrigerator's water filter started leaking. So I replaced it. But two days later, the ceiling tiles in Joe's mom's basement apartment, which is underneath our kitchen, were wet. So we called the plumber to see if we had an ongoing leak or if I had fixed it. It only cost us $200 for him to tell us, nope, you fixed it. And all was well. That is, until last Thursday, when unexpectedly a new puddle in the kitchen appeared. So we called our appliance repair guy for him to come and take a look at things. And while we were waiting for him to show up, the refrigerator exploded. Water shoosted out of the bottom of the fridge like a fire hose on crack. In seconds, the kitchen floor was covered and water was moving like a herd of wet antelopes into the dining room. I knew the filter was the problem, so I immediately tried to pull it out. But every time I tried, it shot me in the face, totally ignoring my high status and my holy calling. While Joe grabbed towels to soak up the lake, I ran downstairs to turn off the emergency water shutoff valve to the house. Now, you would think that emergency shutoff valves would be located in a convenient place in case of, say, an emergency. But no, that is not the case. I finally got to it, turned it off, but when I got upstairs, water was still gushing out of the refrigerator. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. To make matters worse, all of a sudden, our smoke detector started going off. I figured since I turned off the water, it was telling us that our sprinkler system was now disabled. But that was fine because we had enough water everywhere else. And as I was mopping up water frantically, I had two thoughts. First, maybe I didn't turn off the emergency valve all the way. And second, we don't have a sprinkler system. But what we did have was water pouring in and through our smoke detectors downstairs, which apparently when they get wet, they yell, fire, fire, fire. All that water pouring down from the ceiling, I have to tell you, it looked like a scene from Titanic, except we're not Irish. I ran to the emergency shutoff valve again and turned it all the way off. And as I was headed back upstairs, Joe's mom came out to tell me that her ceiling was leaking. Apparently, even though the water was now off, 
there was a lagoon in between the floors that had decided to come down on her head. It was like the days of Noah and Joe's mom wasn't allowed on the ark. We spent the next two plus hours mopping up. And when everything was sort of dry, Joe turned to me and said, you know that hot tub you wanted to put in the upstairs bedroom? It's not going to happen. Here's the point. Surprising explosive encounters change everything. Just ask Paul. Of all the people to whom Jesus appeared after his resurrection, Paul was absolutely the most unlikely. True, the appearance to Peter was a bit unexpected since he had denied Jesus three times. But we all figured that Jesus would forgive him. After all, a while back, Peter had asked Jesus how many times he had to forgive someone who had sinned against him. Peter thought seven. Jesus said 77, which is another way of saying don't count, don't hold grudges, just forgive. So Jesus appearing to Peter to forgive him is not that unexpected. Now, the appearance to James, on the other hand, was truly unexpected. While James was Jesus' half-brother, he was not a disciple. In fact, he was antagonistic towards Jesus' ministry and even thought that Jesus was out of his head crazy. All James wanted before the crucifixion was for Jesus to stop causing the family embarrassment and to come home. But then again, James was still family. And so maybe this did make some sense. Yes, it is surprising, but it's not unthinkable. Paul, on the other hand, was a shocker. He was not a disciple, and he was not family. In fact, he had never met or even seen Jesus. And even if he had seen him, that would have been two or three years ago. And everyone thought that all the resurrection encounters took place before the ascension, and this was well after the ascension. That day had come and gone. And here's another shocker. He wasn't even Paul. At this point in the story, he was Saul from Benjamin, probably named after Israel's first king. He wouldn't become Paul until much later in the story. Interestingly, Saul means asked for as in Israel asked for a king like the other nations. It was a proud name. Paul means little. It's a humble name, which I think served to remind Paul that he couldn't do it on his own. He always needed God's grace. But back to why Paul saw was such a shocker. While Peter and James were guilty of all sorts of things, they weren't responsible for stoning Stephen to death. Plus, no matter what they did, Peter and James both loved Jesus. They may have had a funny way to show it, but they loved him. Saul hated Jesus with a passion, and for good reason. Jesus pretended to be the Messiah. And while he did some amazing things, two things proved he was lying. He died, and he was crucified. See, messiahs don't die, and they aren't cursed by God. But everyone knew that the Bible said that anyone who was ex executed on a cross was cursed by God. But Jesus was only half the problem. The problem for Saul were these stinking Christ followers. Instead of running off and hiding like the followers of other failed messiahs, these yahoos were still advancing Jesus' teaching in word and deed. And that was not just wrong, that was dangerous. See, Saul, a devout and well-studied Pharisee, believed that while nothing could be done to either hurry or to stop the arrival of the Messianic age, sin and apostasy on a national scale could delay it significantly. And that's what these Christ followers were doing. 
by enticing the nation to believe this heresy, they were delaying the inbreaking of the real messianic age. And Saul had given his whole life to pave the way so that the true Messiah could come. And it was so close to happening. It was right beyond his grasp. But now these Jesus followers were wrecking everything. So Saul knew what he had to do. For the sake of the nation, these people had to be stopped. And so he gave his enthusiastic support for the stoning of Stephen. And he breathed out murderous threats against the disciples in Jerusalem. And then he got letters from the high priest authorizing him to go to Damascus to find and arrest any of Jesus' followers there. There's a gruesome story in Numbers 25. The people of Israel were on their way to the Promised Land when they must have pulled off at a truck stop and noticed these Moabite women. And these Moabite women really caught their eyes. And so they decided to pursue these women instead of pursuing the Promised Land. And so off they went to party together. And these women invited these men to have an even better time by joining with them in their worship of Baal, who you might remember was a fertility god. Love and worship, love and worship, go together like a pagan courtship. And so while everyone is dancing around, God sends a plague upon the people. And as the plague starts, Moses gathers the elders of the people together to give them instructions on how to stop all this carousing. But as he is speaking, here comes this Israelite man with this Moabite woman in his arms. They are both all giggles as they slip into a tent together, totally ignoring Moses and all of the elders who are watching this take place right in front of their very eyes. And when Phineas the priest saw this, he grabbed a spear, went into that tent, and impaled both of them while they were lying face to face. And the plague stopped, and Israel was saved. Why, for goodness sake, am I telling you this story on Easter Sunday? There are children present and impressionable youth. Why do you tell us these crazy stories? Because while Saul was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ, he did not feel like he was being cruel and heartless. He did not feel guilty. Instead, he felt like he was saving the nation. He felt he was stopping the plague. He felt like he was a modern-day Phineas. So here is Saul on his way to Damascus to arrest both men and women who are following Jesus. And then suddenly a light blinds him and he falls to the ground and he hears this voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul responds, persecute you, persecute you? I don't even know you. Who are you, Lord? Now, I think it's safe to say that at this point, Saul's head explodes. Here he was, a good Pharisee, doing God's will by persecuting God's enemies. And now, God accuses him of persecuting God's people? He knew that is what he heard. But none of that made any sense whatsoever. And so, in a fog, he asks if the voice speaking to him could identify himself and be clearer about what he is saying. And the voice says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. If Saul's head didn't explode earlier, it does now. And the voice adds, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And with that, the encounter is over. The men traveling with Saul saw the light, but could not distinguish what was said. Now they were fine, but Saul, not so much. When he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. And so his men lead him by the hand into Damascus. And the text says, for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink 
anything. Hold that thought. And then at the end of the three days, a disciple from Damascus named Ananias comes to Saul's house and places his hands on him and restores his sight. And he says to Saul, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then five things happen one after another. First, the scales fall off Saul's eyes so he can see. Second, Saul is baptized. Third, he gets something to eat so that he can regain his strength. Fourth, he spends several days talking with the disciples in Damascus. And then five, he begins preaching in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God, the promised Messiah, and the resurrected Lord. Wow! And all God's people said, what happened in those three days? Answer, Saul became a Christ follower. Ananias makes that clear. He calls Saul Brother Saul not breathing out murderous threats and persecuting the church, Saul. And he confirms that it was Jesus who met him on the road to Damascus. And he tells Saul that he is not being punished, but he's being recruited to preach to the Gentiles. And then he witnesses Saul being filled with the Spirit, which can only happen to a disciple of Jesus. But what convinced Saul that Jesus was the Messiah? What in the world could have changed Saul, the Phineas clone, to Saul, the follower of Jesus? The only thing that I can think of was that he was convinced that God had raised Jesus from the dead. See, for Saul, Jesus being dead meant that he was not the Messiah. But now, Jesus was alive, which would have to mean that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus was cursed by God because he was hung on a tree. But now, he is alive, resurrected by God, which would have to mean that he wasn't cursed by God after all. Or, he was cursed by God for us as an atoning sacrifice for our sins and then was vindicated by God. And Saul had despised Jesus because his whole life was a sham and his teachings were misguided lies. But now Jesus was alive, which would have to mean that God approved of everything that Jesus did and said. And Saul understood that Jesus' death on the cross was the definitive marker of Jesus' defeat. But now, Jesus was alive, which would have to mean that somehow the cross was a victory. And Saul had thought that dead meant dead until the resurrection at the end of time. But Jesus was alive now, which would have to mean that Jesus had conquered death, which would have to mean that Jesus had also conquered sin, since sin and death are the same sides, or the two sides of the same coin. And Saul had thought that to be righteous, one must keep the law, and that by being a Pharisee of the Pharisees was a good way to be welcomed into God's good graces. But now Jesus was alive, which would have to mean that keeping the law wasn't the way as much as following Jesus was. And Saul had understood that he had a mission from God to put an end to this Jesus cult. But now, Jesus was alive, and Saul was still alive, which would have to mean that he still had a mission, but now it was to announce to everyone that Jesus was Lord. And you've got to think that Saul was asking why Jesus would reveal himself to him of all people, since if Jesus was alive, then Saul was terribly guilty of all sorts of sins, terrible things, including St the stoning of Stephen, which would have to mean that it's not by works at all, but only by the grace of God that we are welcomed into God's good graces. What Saul was doing for those three days, when he did not eat or drink, 
he was having his head explode in every direction because he was in a whole new reality. Jesus had risen from the grave, and that meant that Jesus was the Messiah, and that meant that everything had changed. If you've never seen the movie Harvey with Jimmy Stewart, well, shame on you. It's the story of this very pleasant man and his best friend, Harvey, who just happens to be an invisible, six-foot, talking rabbit. Now, nobody can see Harvey except for Stuart. Even we never see Harvey. But he makes his presence known in all sorts of different ways, and every once in a while, he does reveal himself to someone else. And near the end of the movie, Harvey befriends a man who doesn't want to believe in invisible six-foot talking rabbits, but slowly comes to accept that Harvey is real, even though he really doesn't want to do that. But when he finally accepts the truth, he says these incredible words, fly specks, fly specks. I've been spending my life among fly specks while miracles have been happening downtown. Saul looks at his life and at everything he had believed in and says, fly specks, fly specks. I've wasted my life pursuing my own agenda while God's miracle, God's Messiah had come to earth in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And we know that this is true because while we killed the author of life, God has raised him from the dead. And from that moment on, Saul basically becomes Paul the Apostle. And everything changed. See, surprising, explosive encounters change everything. Now, some of you can attest to how God intercepted you and how that surprising, explosive encounter changed everything in your life. But some of you may be skeptical and wondering how this could possibly be true. So let me close with four quick thoughts to help us navigate these new strange waters. First, some of you are thinking that while the resurrection is a great story, it can't possibly be true. Dead, after all, is dead. There is a story about the very famous atheist, Bertrand Russell, who after giving a lecture on why he didn't believe in the existence of God, was asked what he would say to God if on Judgment Day he found out that he was wrong. And Russell replied, I will say, I'm terribly sorry, but you didn't give us enough information. You may agree with Russell and think, perhaps if we all had our own private Damascus Road experience, where the living Jesus appeared to us, then we would all believe. But as it stands, isn't the best we can do to be agnostic about such things. But is it true that we don't have enough evidence? See, I think we know for certain that something happened that dramatically changed the trajectory of Paul's life and James's life and many other lives. Their own testimony said that it was the resurrection that moved them from disbelief to faith. It was that the now living Jesus appeared to them. Now, if you don't want to believe them, then you must suggest something else that will explain what transformed these men and all the others. Because this we know, something happened. If it wasn't the resurrection, what was it? What would be so profoundly moving that it would dramatically change the lives of these people? To me, the thing that makes the most sense out of all the evidence is that the living, resurrected Jesus appeared to them. Second, I believe that the resurrection not only makes sense of what happened on that first Easter Sunday, but also everything about life. C.S. Lewis said it this way, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. To me, Christianity makes sense of my world. 
It makes sense of things like death and hope and beauty and goodness and all the deep longings of my soul. It explains who I am and what's wrong with us and why we often don't feel at home in our world and are never really satisfied in it. I believe Christianity explains all of that. St. Augustine wrestled with these same questions, and here's how he resolved it. He wrote, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. See, Christianity explains the longings and the frustrations of the human heart. And the resurrection proves that that explanation is true. Third, the resurrection of Jesus tells us that Jesus was right, that living a life of love is a better way to live, that forgiveness and grace makes life sing, that giving and not selfishness makes life rich, that serving others is the path to happiness, that faith and hope give life meaning, and that living in alignment with the kingship of Jesus brings joy. These are the qualities I want in my life. These are the things that I want to define me. And the best and the only way, really, to move towards these things is to give myself to Jesus. I love this quote from Rachel Held Evans. She writes, I am a Christian because the story of Jesus is still the story I'm willing to risk being wrong about. Even if it wasn't true, I would still want to follow Jesus. But since it is true, then there is no question. I will follow Jesus and walk in the way of love. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and He is the God of love who calls His people to love one another. Last point. In 1737, Jonathan Edwards wrote an essay with an incredibly long title, A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God in the Conversion of Many Hundred Souls. That's very nice. But the title makes it sound like the conversions in the Great Awakening were somehow surprising and every other conversion was ordinary. But that's not true. That's not true at all. Whenever God encounters us, it is always a surprising work. Grace is always surprising. And here's the thing. Head-exploding grace is yours for the asking. N.T. Wright says, The resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong to it. Don't waste your life on fly specks. Jesus has risen, and today he invites you, no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done, no matter if you have great faith or hardly any faith, he invites you to be rooted in the story of the resurrection so that you can take hold of a life that is truly life. And if you come to him, he promises to pour out upon you in abundance his love and peace and engulf and immerse you in his grace so that for all eternity, your head will explode with joy. That's the promise of God written in blood on a cross made of wood. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your amazing love, for all that you did to secure our salvation. We are your people, people of the risen Lord, and we thank you today that we are incorporated into the risen Christ so that we now stand perfect in your sight. Before we had no chance of ever being eternally happy, as St. Gregory said, but now we have found the joy of the Lord in the risen Savior. Give us your spirit that we may always live in light of the resurrection, that we may be filled with faith, hope, and love, and joy. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
join me in the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards us and give us peace. Stay safe, stay well, stay connected at the river's edge. God bless you all. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed.